I am so pleased to introduce program alum Ann Quito, the writer and editor of the book we're all here to celebrate today. Um, I actually did not have the pleasure of teaching in the program when Ann was a student here, but it's been an absolute delight learning and uh, learning about and also reading her work. Um, Ann's MFA thesis, which was titled Designing a Country from Scratch, Nation Branding in South Sudan, explored the branding of that country, literally the process of a establishing the identity of a new nation that emerged in the past decade following decades of civil war. Anne's particular lens on design writing examines the relationship between visual culture and politics, which she manifests through her work as a staff reporter at Quartz Magazine. But Anne has written about a lot of topics, and in no particular order, Emmanuel Macron, we work, Braille, play, um, work that's appeared on Quartz and Eye on Design, Metropolis Magazine, and 99U, among other publications. And I think it's a pretty impressive range of topics by an extraordinary writer. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Ann Quito, who will also introduce our speakers tonight. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so great to see so many of you here. As Jennifer mentioned, I had a great honor and privilege to work on MagMen with Milton and Walter. Some of you have asked me, how did this happen to you? Um, I'll tell you. I came, uh, and they kind of already knew what they wanted to do. Um, and for six or so months, we worked in Milton's office building on East 32nd Street, where New York Magazine was founded. You can imagine it was quite the milieu to write a book about the history of designing magazines. Imagine stacks of beautiful, brittle back issues, if you're into that. Folders of facts, correspondence, um, paste ups done by hand, and not to mention the daily joy of being just around Walter and Milton. So here's the plan for tonight. I have prepared um, a handful of questions. Some of them have been sent in by the students of the SVA MA in design research, writing, and criticism. Um, there will be a simple reception right after. Milton and Walter will be on hand to sign books in the lobby. But before we dive in, I thought a brief introduction on these two men kind of switched um, next to me in case you just walked in and didn't know what this is. Uh, first, Walter Bernard, this guy. Walter has been the designer and art director of many of the best-known magazines and newspapers in the US, including Time, Fortune, and The Atlantic. He's also designed several books and co-produced the fascinating HBO documentary, Portrait of a Lady. Walter is the recipient of the prestigious Henry R. Luce Lifetime Achievement Award for his work at Time, Inc. And just now, we calculated he's a true lover of magazines, he, and he's a subscriber to at least 13 magazines and newspapers today. Um, Milton Glaser. I'm just editing his bio from the book. I'll just say Milton Glaser is the most influential and eloquent graphic designer of our time. He's known to many of you as the genius behind the I Heart New York logo. But beyond that, he's designed countless books, emblems, record albums, posters, and interiors, including this very theater we're in tonight. In, 20, in 2009, President Barack Obama awarded Milton the National Medal of Arts, the first graphic designer to receive this honor. Would you please help me welcome Walter and Milton. All right, my first question, um, as an introduction, I've been thinking about how magazines and books shape our sensibility and our worldview. I wonder if you could give us an idea of what you read as kids. Walter, you grew up in New Jersey, Milton in the Bronx. Could you cite some of your favorite magazines growing up? I read comic strips, Smokey Stover, Terry and the Pirates, Superman, when he finally emerged, I was already 10 or 12 years old. I read the Sad Evening Post and Collier's. And I was a sucker for anything visual, whether it was an illustration or a photograph. And I always loved pictures. 
And for me, a magazine was basically a parade of pictures. Uh, but I was deeply influenced by them, and particularly as every other kid that ever went to art school was, I started by tracing comic strips. Well, I came a little later than you did, so I did see the Saturday Evening Post. My father um, and mother had Collier's in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, we lived in New Jersey. We got the Daily News and the Daily Mirror from New York. That was my um, insight into the big city. Mm. Um, we also somehow at one point got Time magazine. And in uh, the dentist's office, I saw Esquire. Mm. And that's when I really wanted to work in magazines. Mm. I, I loved the idea of Esquire. Henry Wolf was the art director at the time. And he signed his covers. I mean, he wrote his name on some of his covers. And I thought that was really great. Mm. Also, inside, there was a list of all the people who worked on the magazine. Mm. And I thought, that's great. They put your name on every, every <laughs> one of them. I, I thought that was great. And, and um, so visually, I was influenced by Esquire. And at the time, there were a lot of uh, paperback books, as you all know. And the other name whose signature I could recognize at the time, you can't recognize it now, was Milton Glazer's. He actually had a clear signature on his illustrations, and he did so many paperback novels, the Shakespeare series and others, that you could not escape um, the uniqueness of his work. So that was my introduction to um, visual material. Great. I want to say something uh, about the uh, peculiarities of early experiences, or perhaps all experiences, where you don't know what they're going to lead to. Mm. I remember as a child looking at the crude halftone reproductions of the comics on the weekend in Daily News and Daily Mirror, and discovering that they were all made out of little tiny dots. For those of you who are very old, you realize they were called <laughs> Ben Day patterns, <laughs> named after somebody named Ben, ben or Day. Day. I don't yeah. know which. But if you took a glass and looked at them carefully, they exploded into little overlapping points that, by virtue of their proximity and differences in tonality, produces a full range of color in quite a miraculous way, the idea that these little tiny dots could reproduce the entire quality of a human face in actual color with the nose being more red than the ears astonished me. And I discovered this uh, af affection for dots that has followed me throughout my life as recently as one or two years ago where I began doing dot studies of forms, overlapping forms, still dealing with the miracles of transparency and proximity, which was really my earliest introduction to this so-called field of graphic arts. I love that. One thing <laughs> missing from your bio is that you co-founded New York Magazine in 1967 with Clay Felker. Since you were the only one there, could you tell us why and how you wanted to start New York Magazine? Well, Clay was uh, the editor for a while of the Herald Tribune Sunday Supplement, which had a magazine called New York mm. in it. And he worked there for a while. And after that, uh, publication closed. And uh, uh, the New York insert was removed. Clay discovered that he could buy the rights to the name New York for a magazine. Mm. And at a relatively modest price. And after that, he said, one evening as we were having dinner together, why don't we do a magazine called New York again? <laughs> the old New York in the Herald Tribune was a prototype for where we began, and we started very much uh, in the pattern that it has established. That pattern didn't serve us entirely well mm. for many obvious reasons, one of which was that the magazine itself 
had to be visible, and the old one was an insert and didn't have to be. But that difference in uh, where the magazine was located changed, as everything does, the content entirely. Mm. So we started doing it in a way that was a step down or up from the old one, and then discovered that was not the right path. Mm. And when you say that, it had a great impact on the cover, on your cover approach, right? right. We just saw on screen the first, um, I think, two issues of New York yeah, Magazine. Right. And then you changed because you had to compete on the newsstand. Well, the old, the old editions had stock covers that were unrelated to the content of that issue. Mm. They were just beautiful scenes of New York and New York events. That This is a photograph, actually, we commissioned from Jay Maisel, a wonderful photographer. Uh, but we would never do a cover at this distance from the subject as we did at the beginning. Uh, and we soon discovered that stock covers, which say scenes of New York, was not working on the newsstand. Mm. When I got to New York Magazine, I opened one of those uh, file drawers and found proofs. Some of them were stock, but some of them were commissioned. They were people like Jay Maisel and others who had done photo photographs that had already been selected, and they were all engraved and all ready to go for maybe the next six months. But Milton, um, after I was hired, uh, realized that you can't put 40 cents, the magazine cost 40 cents at that time, that was a lot of money, 40 cents for a magazine that looked like the one they got for free mm. only months ago. And um, suddenly we had to actually do covers every week. Mm. I think there's a slide here when the covers kind of suddenly changed. Yes, and, and you can see that um, one of the hallmarks of New York early on was a reliance on illustration. Mm. Uh, photography was, A, difficult to reproduce in some cases. We had a short deadline and not a good engraver. Mm. And um, drawings actually printed much better. Mm. Um, also, they could be done mm. quickly. I think I, I went ahead of myself. I forgot to probe, how did you meet? How, why did you have, you, have, you hired Milton? Well, like most of the people in this room, <laughs> I was a student of Milton's at SVA <laughs> at night. <laughs> I, I went to a terrible school up the street called the Art Career School on, in the Flatiron Building. And uh, I later learned that there was uh, a new school starting uh, on 23rd Street. Um, I went down there to look uh, it over, and there was a brochure and it said, showed half of Henry Wolfe's face and half of Milton Glaser's face. And it said, design for the Ugly written word. Picture. <laughs> and they were teaching a joint class at night, which I signed up for. And that was the beginning of meeting uh, the two icons. Milton, what was it in Walter that made you hire him and stick with him all these years? Oh, <laughs> he was very uh, likable. <laughs> he had tremendous energy, enthusiasm. He knew what he was doing. He had mm. a good sense of order, organization, and, and we got along. The mystery of human relationship is really so fascinating. You see people engaged, you can't imagine what keeps them together, and others who don't seem that they'll ever speak a civil word to one another, and, but turn out to love each other. It's very mysterious. And I have benefited enormously from partnerships throughout my life. I've had wonderful partnerships. In fact, I've only had good partnerships. And uh, it is a very complex interaction, as you know. I mean, I'm telling you something. <laughs> you all know how complex any other human being is and how changeable they are and how adaptive you have to be to make something work. But Walter and I got along exceedingly well. We still do to this very day after 60 years or so. And uh, it was a great pleasure being with him and finding that we were in agreement uh, about what we wanted to achieve. I wanted to mention one thing about um, the covers. 
<clears throat> what that uh, during the golden age of magazines and uh, uh, colliers and sad evening posts, they really depend on an illustration before the development of sophisticated photography. And they had some of the great uh, illustrators of the world. And then gradually, photography began to replace illustration as a uh, form for most magazines. Almost all magazines became photographic for any number of reasons, including the sense that they were real at one point, as opposed to imagined. And we saw the opportunity in this, in fact, we had a functional requirement, which is we didn't have the money to pay or the time to use photography. We found that there were innumerable genius illustrators around the city who could do astonishing work and get paid very little money and would work through the night and through the day to meet a deadline. And we produced uh, innumerable co covers that were based on an illustrative form, which also at the same time separated us from everything else that was going on at the time. Mm. At the same time, though, we did discover and, and not that we discovered, but we were able to use some photographers, Carl Fisher, Dan Wynn, uh, Jay Maisel partially, but, but um, photographers who made their money in advertising and loved New York Magazine. Mm -hmm. And they would do enormous jobs for us for $250. And, and because they enjoyed it. And Carl Fisher and Dan Wynn, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not naming the others, Matthew Klein, others, did an enormous amount of covers for us in overnight, in many cases, building sets, because they had studios, most of them with carriage houses of, uh, and a staff of four or five that could really turn things around. And they worked for us the way they worked for big advertising clients. Mm. And we got some really, very good results. Speaking of making sets, the thing that was really astounding to me and maybe to many graphic designers who grew up with a computer is that you made 52 issues of this magazine by hand. It seems miraculous. That it you, is. It is. <laughs> that you would produce a weekly by hand. Could you walk us through a production schedule? Do you wake up in a panic? Like, what happens? Start on a Monday. Well, first of all, you're, you're hoping to get a manuscript. And, and, and when Clay didn't have it and he would say, God will provide, we were getting worried. But the next thing would be a, a, a manuscript, which, um, you know, Milton and I um, worked on two different floors. Milton was running Pushpin Studio, and I was up on the fourth floor at New York Magazine. We didn't have any formal meetings. We met. Uh, that picture that Cosmos took <laughs> was occasional. Often we met on the stairs, or I would run down to his studio. He um, loves interruption, so we would simply have these short cracks. I'd take part of a manuscript, he'd read it, I'd read it, we'd talk about it quickly and, and move. The, uh, but the, the next step, aside from deciding what we might do for a cover or an illustration or an assignment, was you had to mark up copy. Mm. You had to specify every way the typeset would be mm. in order to get, by the next day, galleys. And those galleys would go to editors to edit, to us, to count, mm. to others to uh, uh, proofread. And all those galleys would then go into, uh, back to the typesetter, who would make reproduction pages. Mm. We didn't, never did layouts except on tissue paper. We just made instructions on a, on a tissue that would uh, tell them how to set that page. And then each page would have to be pasted up. Now, Milton, God save him, was uh, at Pushpin, and he went. He was. A, he works very quickly, and he comes in at nine and leaves at five. But at midnight, <laughs> there were a lot of corrections to be made, mm -hmm. and we would have people with tweezers and uh, um, Elmer's glue fixing commas and putting in semicolons and capital letters in order to get the magazine out on Thursday, and everybody did that every week. Let me interrupt just to augment that, to imagine what this is like. You get these proofs in. They're still wet for the printer. 
you have to do something, a term that no longer exists, powder to the proof. Yeah. That meant taking some talcum powder and the, sprinkling it on the proof so it would absorb the excess ink so the proof would not smear a moment later when you were putting it down. And then you'd have to cut them into galley sheets and paste them down. And then if there is an error in spelling, somebody would go with a razor blade, cut out the A or B out of it, pick it out, get another correct A or B, put a little bit of rubber cement on the back and paste it back into that space. Can you imagine anyone ever doing such a thing? Well, not since medieval times, anyhow. <laughs> but the complexity of doing that and the investment in human labor, not to say eyesight, uh, was so fantastic, but we didn't know it. No, it no, seemed it very... seemed um, like the ordinary, ordinary thing that anybody would do any day, so. And you made it extra hard for yourselves because someone had to put together the issue and take a train, right, every week. Well, for They're... some reason, in Clay's and Milton's wisdom, <laughs> our typesetter was in Philadelphia. <laughs> I mean. At Curtis. So we had messengers going from New York to Philadelphia several times a day just to get these proofs. Um, I think in, about two years later, we finally got a typesetter in New York. Mm -hmm. But we dreaded snowstorms. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever miss an issue during that time? Never. No. Uh, there was a rumor that uh, a truck was hijacked once oh. uh, on its way to Buffalo and that um, uh, the magazine wouldn't be delivered, but it turned out to be uh, not true. Thank so goodness. we were, we were. Otherwise, we were all going to have to go back mm. and start from scratch to do an issue. Mm. Milton, you were not only the magazine's co-founder and design director, but you're also one of its food critics. <laughs> Can you tell us about un your underground gourmet days? Well, I had a good friend, Jerome Snyder, who's no longer, no longer with us. Was a wonderful illustrator and art director, scientific American, and we had a long relationship. Where we loved to uh, astonish each other on the cheap restaurants we had discovered around the city. And one day we said, "We should do this as a column." Uh, the one thing people want to know about in this city is where to find cheap, good food. But magazines are not interested in that because cheap restaurants don't advertise. Mm. So there was never such a thing as coverage of cheap restaurants in the city, ever. No one would do a piece on a little joint in Harlem because they couldn't take out an ad. As a result, that segment of investigation was never dealt with until Jerome and I said this would be something people would like to read about. And so. We would spend our time going to small joints all over the city, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Lower Manhattan, Chinatown, and so on, five days a week usually, and then write a column once a week for the magazine. But it had, I have to say, uh, an enormous effect on life in the city because it, in those days, it's hard to believe, uh, People thought that um, outlying neighborhoods were so dangerous, they wouldn't go eating in an in a ethnic neighborhood. They wouldn't go to Chinatown. They wouldn't go to Harlem. They wouldn't go anywhere where they thought there was some danger or threat. And this idea that this was a great attribute of the city, that's one of the great things that New York has to offer, is this extraordinary range of ethnic food and unusual food and isolated things that you never could taste anywhere else in the world and so on. And that was one of the great discoveries that we made was a connection with most people who lived here who realized it was possible and even socially approved to go to other parts of the city to find out what the food was like. I think Milton, un underground gourmet also 
was very important to New York Magazine because, unbeknownst to us at the time, it really bonded the reader with the magazine. It, mm. it, the magazine at the beginning, and this is in 1968-69, had to prove to its readers that we were on their side. Mm. And that was the whole idea of Clay and Milton when they started, that this magazine was about New Yorkers, done by New Yorkers, for New Yorkers. And Underground Gourmet was one of the key elements, along with a few others, that really bonded us to the city. Mm because it became very popular. We, you know, from a, from a little column, it became big features, cover stories. We had wonderful competitions. We, and, and I got to um, eat with Jerome and, and, and Milton, uh, you know, at least twice a week. I mean, I had, where we'd go to a restaurant and, and try everything. Before I move on from Underground Gourmet, I want to call out Milton's obsession with Chinese cuisine. Could you tell us about your interest in Chinese food? Oh, I don't know. You compare it to drawing. <laughs> <laughs> I studied Chinese cooking. First of all, it's so rational to be able to cook everything in a single pot. What a brilliant idea that you could do all your cooking for a lifetime in one pot. And that led me to the idea they must know other things about design as well. <laughs> Anyhow, I studied. It's a wonderful cuisine, extraordinarily rich, and mm. all Jewish kids from the Bronx love Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and uh, it, uh, but uh, Chinatown was largely one of those uh, unknown quantities for mm. people who lived here, and I, I have to say that it, it, it part of it was the fact that you would really get to understand that beyond your own enclave, there were other parts of the city that had something to do with you. Mm. And now I am astonished when the New Yorker runs cheap restaurant reviews. <laughs> they never would do that in a million years. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I want to pick up on something you said about New York Magazine's distinctive use of illustration. I think. It wasn't that you used illustration to fill up space, or but you use this. You use illustrators as visual journalists. Um, I received this email actually from the faculty director of um, from uh, Washington University in St. Louis. He manages um, Robert Weaver's archive. Let me read it if if I can. So DB Dowd asks. I'm very curious about the inflection point in illustration in the late 1950s and early 1960s when Robert, Robert Weaver and other Manhattan-based illustrators rejected Westport School depictions of the post-war good life, effectively creating the visual version of new journalism as exemplified by the 1968 Nick Pileggi, Bob Weaver collaboration that you see That's here. That's an example, right? There's vir virtually, he says, there's virtually no literature about this. Can you address or describe this shift um, from your perspective at New York as an art director and illustra an illustrator? Well, we were all children of modernism and grew up with this idea that uh, to be cool, you had to be abstract. And so a whole generation of uh, young people grew up thinking that geometric forms were the most informative of all forms and that abstraction was actually uh, uh, superior to what was realistic or narrative. And we were at a point in which there was a return to the idea of information being conveyed through illustrative means as well as through abstract means. Mm. And I have also to say from my own experience in life is that I make absolutely no distinction between design, illustration, weaving. All of these are manifestations of communicating ideas. And we used illustration to communicate ideas, mm. not to be decorative mm. and not to uh, fill the pages, which I, is characteristic of magazines. Mm. But we always used illustration to support and amplify the narrative. And we had a couple of very unique 
um, practitioners of that. Robert Weaver is an example, and Jim McMullen. Both of them um, did not, you, were not doing models the way uh, that, as you say, post-war illustration was. They were reporters. The original thing you saw up here was an assignment to Robert Weaver to cover the uh, story about the police. And, and in this case, it was about the uh, Little Italy. Nick Pelleggi wrote a wonderful story about uh, his experience in Little Italy. And Robert just spent th th uh, days down there drawing. And his drawings were not sketches to be refined somewhere else. They were his sketches, and they were his finishes. And he was just a marvelous reporter. It was sad when his eyesight uh, began to fade many years later. When I was at Time, he did a cover for me, but he couldn't see well anymore. Um, but his insight and, and that early magazine that Milton did, um, he used Robert right from the beginning. But that this uh, Little Italy piece was just breathtakingly um, beautiful. And not only that, it reproduced well. For some reason, we could reproduce uh, his illustrations better than it, we could reproduce anything else. It's important to observe, even as you're looking at these things, that these drawings, from my point of view, are as good as Delacroix or any of the 19th century French draftsmen. They are superb drawings. The fact that they're in a magazine and reporting on life in the ghetto, whatever the subject matter is, doesn't elevate them to the same position. But they are, from a point of view of draftsmanship, observation, communication, they are extraordinary drawings. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky enough to be able to use Weaver and his work really resonated. People looked at those and were very moved by the sense of gesture and quality that it looks like a simple pencil drawing I don't know why, but you can tell the genius behind them. And you had one staff illustrator um, who you used as a visual reporter. Oh, yeah. And in the book, you described that you and Clay wanted to revive, I don't know, the tradition of Winslow Homer in Harper's Weekly. Yeah, there was a guy, Julie, there was a guy, I don't know, I think uh, Clay must have heard of him. There was a guy working in England. We liked his work, Julian Allen. And we went to England. I mean, we went to London, then we looked him up, and we offered him a contract to come to the United States and to be, of all things, a staff illustrator, something that hadn't occurred for many years. And he came, and he was brilliant. He did this kind of flat-footed painting. I, I, I don't know quite how to express it, but they were sort of, in a certain way, naive. Uh, and free of the sense of artifice. As a result of that, they became enormously convincing as imagery. And he would put a, a group of people together like we did for Should These Guys Go to Jail? And you would see the anguish on their faces. And it would look somehow not photographic, not illustrative, but totally convincing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he was... Uh... He was the instigator for us, uh, or he gave us the ability to do a kind of series that we had done, which was the Hidden Watergate and the Mafia at War. Mm. Even though we used many other illustrators because it was such a big project, Julian did most of them. Um, it was the fact that he could do it, and he could recreate scenes in which you had the reporting, but nobody ever mm. uh, witnessed. Mm recreate them so convincingly and beautifully that um, he, he became invaluable to the magazine. Apart from illustrators, you also had great photographers, like this crappy Roz Kelly, who got a uh, super, like, incredible shot. Well, Roz Kelly came t up to me one day with a portfolio and said, I'm a great photographer. I can do anything. And she kept, by the way, we, on the fourth floor at New York Magazine, uh, I don't remember whether we had any receptionists, but the fact is anybody could come up. And, and the next thing you know, somebody would be at your desk, look at my pictures. Oh, I don't have time now. No, look at my pictures. Anyway, she started dancing on the table. And um, I finally decided I'd give her an assignment. Albert Goldman was doing a piece on um, <clears throat> Jimi Hendrix, who was 
doing a concert. And we knew, because Albert Goldman was doing a story about him, that uh, uh, Hendrix stayed at the Drake Hotel. So I said, Ross, here's what you do. You go to the Drake Hotel tonight about 6 o'clock because he has got to go to the concert venue, and he's going to come out of the Drake Hotel. You just take a picture of him, and we'll use it. This was a back of the book story. It wasn't going to be a big story. The next morning, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> but she didn't have any pictures of him outside the hotel. Mm. Roz was really a very ingenious photographer. And you may know her, because she then went to Hollywood. She became Pinky Trocadero on uh, Happy Days. Um, she was in The Owl and the Pussycat. She was in, um, done quite a few um, uh, theatrical things, gave up photography, although there's a site, I think, where you can see her archive. But she did a great job for us that night. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Apart from that, you also had, of course, incredible writers, Tom Wolfe, and one very important person, Gloria Steinem. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what Gloria did. In the, she was a founding editor of New York. And, um, and she, in Ms. Magazine, was actually introduced in the pages of New York Magazine. Could you talk a little bit about Gloria? Well, M Milton will know why. Uh about Clay's interest in uh, supporting that. Well, Gloria was with the magazine at the very beginning. Exactly. And I think her consciousness changed. Uh, she was always an activist, but became more passionate and more invested in women's rights in the process of doing stories mm -hmm. that related to that issue and other kinds of stories as well. As you know, she's a beautiful, articulate, wonderful woman of an extremely generous nature. Yes. And after a couple of years, she wanted to embark on this women's magazine mm. and put a team together and asked Clay. And Clay was very willing to do this, to support it and help launch it. Mm. And we literally launched it in New York Magazine. It was a great accomplishment for us. And uh, it uh, positioned Gloria at the top of the activists for women's rights mm. and uh, appropriately. Mm. And as you know, she just continued being a wonderful human being since then. And one of her earlier, indeed, one of the earlier articles um, she wrote was about Richard Nixon. I want to talk about Richard Nixon because he seems to be the poster child of, <laughs> you loved him. You loved skewering loved Richard Nixon. In, with as much gusto as maybe we caricature, caricature the current president, he's made so he's been on so many covers. Nixon. Nixon. Yeah. Well, he was he was <laughs> our meat. He. It, this was in the mid '70s and the early '70s when uh, um, Nixon was uh, a prominent figure that uh, we couldn't resist. We had several artists. Um, uh, do a story that, uh, I'm sorry, not do a story, do a feature about how I draw Nixon because everybody did wonderful caricatures. It was with Gloria's uh, cover story, Learning to Live with Nixon. It's in the book, The Recipe on How to Draw Nixon. And a few more, maybe. Um. We love it. It's one of the uh, interesting things about the nature of perception. How is it? that we can tell every face in the world as being different from one another, with only these little elements of distance between the eyebrow and the eye to guide us. Well, how could this be no other human being but Richard Nixon? I mean, there's no information there except a hairline, but that is sufficient. It couldn't be anyone else. It's brilliantly realized uh, by, by Wilcox, David, David Wilcox. Wilcox. But it's just an astonishing piece of work. The other thing that really is our favorite, yes. somebody said it was the funniest thing ever published. I think it's true. <laughs> it's the Nixon eggplant. Somebody came up, one of our contributors came up one day 
and had a box. I said, what's in the box? She said, it's the Nixon eggplant. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? I said, Nixon eggplant. I don't see anything. What is there? She pulled it out. I said, that just looks like an eggplant. And she said, oh, yeah? And then she turned it around. <laughs> and voila! <laughs> And th these are pre-Photoshop days. But to be sure, to ascertain that no manipulation happened, you got what? Yeah, well, we put in a little certificate, say, with an, a notary saying that was guaranteed unretouched. Well, that notary was Jerome Snyder. Huh? Jerome was a notary. <laughs> and you can see his signature. Jerome Snyder signed it. Yeah. But it was actually, he was a legal no notary. Mm. And then? One of the editors took it home and had it for dinner. Is that right? Uh, Byron Dobell had that's, it for dinner. That's what we heard. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1977, um, all the joy and shenanigans at New York Magazine quickly came to an end. Um, because of Rupert Murdoch's takeover, um, there's this great photograph of this day with Clay Felker standing on a desk um, yeah. Could you tell us about this day? Could you take us to the newsroom on that day? Well, it was a sad day, uh, partially because Clay brought it on himself in that he could never get along with the board of directors. Mm. And they were always wanting to do things, and Clay didn't want to do them, and whatever else it was. Actually, he was heroic in his resistance to editorial interference. And uh, everybody said, and it, Clay didn't have the votes to change it, that they would, they had enough mm. and they wanted to sell the magazine and put the magazine up for sale. And uh, Rupert Murdoch bought it, who incidentally may be the most evil man in the world. Well, we. <laughs> Somebody's trying to best him right now. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, Clay rose to the occasion and, and gave a talk that was actually very inspirational and very moving. Mm. And how many people quit the next day? Well, 60, it was 70? January Almost 1st, 1977. Walked, walked um, he took over, and December 31st, we were all gone basically, or a, a lot of people. We, we, no, no, a good part of the staff. In, in left. all fairness, there were, there were young people who needed to work. They, mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 Milton had Pushpin Studio. I was going to just look for another job. But there were other people who, you know, on January 2nd, they couldn't suddenly take their portfolios and run around. Mm -hmm. So um, we, some of them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, stayed uh, to produce. No, but Walter, Walter, it's very unusual if somebody gets fired for the staff, half the staff to walk off the well, that's job true. on any uh, circumstances. A lot. And most of the, the top yeah. editors left. Yeah. It was an extraordinary act. Mm. And it actually demonstrates the cohesion and the affection we had for one another and being at the magazine. Mm. It was a wonderful place to be. Mm. Now, Moving on from New York Magazine. So the book actually details um, a lot of your magazine work. And one of the magazines that you designed early on is Parry Match, Milton. And you did this in record time. Can you tell us about your weekend in Paris? Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's one of my <laughs> favorite self-inflating stories. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I got a call from the editors of Perry Match through a, a friend, an associate. Pruvo was the editor-in-chief, asked if he could have lunch with me. And I had lunch and he said, I'd like you to redesign Perry Match. It's become old and fuddy-duddy. And I want to bring it up to date and have a really inspired, fresh look and new approach. And I said, well, you know, get me some issues. Uh, I'll, I'll take them back to New York and do a study for you. And in a couple of weeks, I'll outline a proposal. He said, no, 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 no. I want a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I found that idea very appealing. <laughs> and we got the team together. I speak no French. Uh, we got the team together, and somehow through hand signals and rudimentary English and so on, we worked for two days through the night, only bolstered by some oysters and champagne. And we actually did it. We actually completely redesigned the magazine front to back. And it came out the following week as an entirely new magazine. Mm. And I say in the, in the book, I went out that night. It was about 2 in the morning. And I said to myself, Paris, you owe me one. <laughs> And there's a trick here, right? You added the word nouveau. Oh, I folded down. The, I had to keep uh, the sense that it was not a new magazine that they hadn't heard of, but also that something had happened that they should pay attention to. And so I folded down the corner to make a little nouveau. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. There it is. There it is. You also did A cheap trick, but it worked. Mm. You also designed Audience magazine, a short-lived, beautiful magazine. Yeah, it was a nice heart. Mm. I did that with Seymour Cross, my partner at the time. It was a beautiful magazine. It had no advertising, and it was just the charge to us was to just put it together so it looked great, and that's what we did. Mm. Now, Walter, you dove deeper into news magazines um, and joined Time as its art director. Can you tell us about what made you join Time after this exhausting period in New York? Well, I got a call uh, asking me if I'd be interested in redesigning Time magazine, which I didn't like very much as a magazine. But I realized they obviously called me because there were very few people who, Milton, myself, mm. maybe a few others, somebody at Newsweek, doing a weekly magazine. Who had the experience of doing a weekly? So I um, made an arrangement uh, because I didn't want to become the art director of Time. I didn't like the look of it. I said, if you give me three months to redesign it and accept it, I will guarantee working and redoing the magazine on staff for a year. And um, they said, well, OK, we'll let you redesign it, but it's got to be in secret. And Newsweek can't know about this. Nobody can know about it. I had no office at the time. I had just left time. Milton was at 41st Street, where old New York, uh, the new New York magazine was, and hadn't moved yet. So he gave me space in the 32nd Street the original. office. And I hired Rudy Hoagland, and we started in secret working on time. Uh, I only had one contact at Time Magazine. It was Ray Cave. He was my contact and the person I could talk to, but nobody else could know about it. It's like spy games. Then, a few weeks later, Milton moves back into the building with his own secret project, Newsweek. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for a period of months, I'm on the first floor secretly redesigning Time, and he's on the second floor secretly redesigning Newsweek. And we couldn't talk about it. We didn't show it to each other. Nobody knew about it except us. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was hilarious. Um, but in any case, it turned out that um, um, they did accept uh, and during Time. And, and I agreed to go there. And I, I really had a wonderful time. It was totally different from New York Magazine, with a staff of five or six people to a staff of 25 people. Mm. So from the scrappy New York Magazine newsroom, you entered Time, Inc. Can you tell us about your first day or like what kind of perks you had? This is like deep Mad Men. Completely different. Mm. Well, first of all, it was in a beautiful building with wonderful offices. We were in Milton's building. He was a tough landlord. We had to complain <laughs> about heat and light bulbs. Um, there was receptionists. There were uh, food carts. There was, but the first day I was there, um, I came naively on a Monday. And I didn't know at Newsweeklies, nobody's there on a Monday. 
So uh, I'm in this office alone, and a guy comes in with a big thing of uh, uh, what looked like a gift box mm. of uh, wine, scotch, all sorts of drinks. And I, I see it on my desk, and I'm looking for the card that says, you know, congratulations on your new job. And I don't find any. And I run after the guy, and he's down the hall, and I lose him. So I assume that I'll find out. Mm. Uh, the following Monday, skipping ahead a week, that guy comes in again with another mm. <laughs> batch. And it turns out that the department heads get a supply of liquor every uh, Monday in order to keep the staff satisfied <laughs> through a long day. They, the staff putting out that magazine was going to work till 2, 3 in the morning, 12, and they would come into my office would be the bar, and they would come in and have a, a drink as they were doing paste-ups and, uh, and layouts. So um, it wasn't a congratulations. It was my duty to uh, distribute <laughs> liquor. <laughs> Sounds like great times. Uh, now, in, at time, you changed a few things. Um, can you talk about a few of those elements? Well, you could elements? see the corner fold looks a lot like uh, uh, Milton's, uh, <laughs> <Thanks> <laughs> Milton's Milton. uh, uh, Paris Nouveau. Uh, the, the idea came to me for two reasons. One was Milton's. The other one was a, a, an AIGA cover I had done many years ago with a folded uh, mm. uh, paper. And, I, and the reason we did it was because the... Um, editor, Henry Grunewald, said, um, we need to find a way to do a second billing. They, time often did not have a second billing on the cover. And when they started to do it, uh, before I got there, it was just a big line on the, on the top. And so I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to give a peek to the inside? Mm -hmm. We could use another picture plus words. And so um, I folded down the corner after I had redone the logo so that the E was big enough to take the fold. Mm. And um, unbeknownst to us, uh, the editors loved it. And we thought, you know, that'll tell them what's inside the issue. But it became kind of a trademark. It became part of the personality mm. of time for a few years and helped us beat Newsweek regularly. And you also introduced new approaches to information graphics. Um, well, yes. You know, as, as Milton was telling you about hiring uh, Julian Allen from uh, England, um, I discovered um, one day uh, uh, I saw Radio Times, and there were interesting charts. And I knew that the uh, time chart department uh, needed help. Uh, the charts were kind of done as fillers. So um, Nigel was taking a vacation in, uh, yeah, Nigel Holmes was taking a vacation in New York, and he came to see me and showed me his portfolio. And I thought, how would you like to move to New York and work for time? And he agreed. And I did exactly, except I had better resources than Milton and Clay. I don't know what they paid Julian, but time moved him and did every, mm. you know, made it very easy for his family to come here. Mm. And he revolutionized charts and graphs. Mm. Now, the example you see there is a little over the top. Uh, it was one of the first ones he did, and, and we calmed him down after, all, <laughs> after that. But it changed the nature of how that was used. First of all, it was used as, as you can see, almost a full page here. Mm. And um, charts did not become these fillers that if an editor needed another 10 lines, it got thrown away. Uh, they became the major part of information graphics and uh, really, again, helped change the personality of the magazine. You were also they did a great job. You're also a time when it changed its definition of man of the year. Maybe very briefly talk us through this cover. Well, as you know, that Man of the Year, its original premise is to name the person. And of course, in, the, in those days, it was Man of the Year, um, who influenced the news of the world for good or evil most profoundly. And in 
that year, the Ayatollah Khomeini coming back from France to Iran and taking over was, and, and, and the hostages taken, the US hostages, was the most influential person in the news that year. Now, previously, time had, had Hitler and the, the emperor of Japan and I think uh, Stalin on yeah. the cover to no problem. When we put him on the cover, we were boycotted. Mm -hmm. Newsstands wouldn't run it. Uh, news distributors didn't want to distribute it. Advertisers were mad. Everybody was up in arms because mm -hmm. they hated mm -hmm. the Ayatollah. How could you give him this honor? Mm -hmm. He said, it's not necessarily an honor. Mm -hmm. Well, after this, time made it an honor. The reader's influence changed the fact. Now when time does man of the year, or person of the year, or woman of the year. It's not about making the most news anymore. Even though they say that's the premise, um, you can see that that's not true. You could see it when Rudy Giuliani was the uh, man of the year in 2001, um, when obviously the person who made the most news was uh, Osama bin Laden. So I'm going to leap to the end of the book, where about, um, in 1982, you formed WBMG, not a radio station, but actually a design consultancy. And you designed Fortune, The Atlantic, Washington Post, Lear, Modern Maturity, and The Nation, and many others. Um, I wonder if you liked, you both worked on staff of magazines. Did you like this mode of coming in and out of existing publications and sort of rethinking them? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like, uh, personally, uh, doing any one thing too frequently. Mm. The nice thing about redesigning a magazine uh, in those terms is that it's a finite experience, that you're not doomed to spend the rest of your life with people you don't necessarily want to be with. <laughs> The nice thing about a magazine like New York was that we all wanted to be with one another. Mm. But when you get an assignment, an honest assignment, I couldn't have lasted at time by virtue of my personality. And uh, uh, while it would be perfectly acceptable to me to do an assignment, a critical assignment to evaluate its effectiveness, I would have dreaded the idea of having to go in every day for 10 years. <laughs> I only did three. Have the same conversation. Mm. So anyhow, yes, so uh, the like answer it. to your question you liked is it. I like doing short-term, <laughs> quick pickups. Mm. And we had a good time. With, yeah. uh, um, the, the reason we started WBMG is because Milton got a call from Jim, Jamie, uh, Jimmy Goldsmith, who's pictured here. And he said he bought a new magazine in France and wanted Milton to redesign it. I almost simultaneously got a call from Ben Bradley mm. in Washington saying, uh, how would you like to redesign the Washington Post? I thought, wow. But again, I didn't have any place. I had left time. I had no uh, studio. I had no staff. And redesigning the Washington Post was no small mm. project. So I called Milton and told him about it. And he told me about mm. um, uh, Jimmy Goldsmith and said, well, why don't we work on it together? And we decided to get back together. We knew how to work together. Mm -hmm. We knew how to work by interruption. We knew how to um, not have meetings or memos or anything yes. like that. Um, and um, we formed WBMG. The first two clients were Washington Post and uh, Lear. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leap to the end papers of the book. One of my favorite parts, really. Um, in the book, you make a specific decision to feature magazines that failed. Failed to launch or didn't really take. And on the end papers, you publish some catty hate mail from readers. Um, why do you think it's important to acknowledge failures in this book? Well, I don't know how you can deny them. Or another way, <laughs> how do you handle criticism in your work or maybe in life? 
I don't know, Milton, you, you know, um, there were there were always letters at New York Magazine, and real letters, by the way. There was no, you know, you got letters, and, and, and they were uh, not, not really design critical, mm. uh, because New York Magazine was evolving and was not really a new design. Mm. So people were critical of articles, et cetera, and sometimes they didn't like a cover. When I got the time and they, um, the, the new design came out, we got letters. I mm. had 700 letters, uh, most of them negative. Mm. Um, mostly negative in the sense that why, could you, why did you change my magazine? Mm. And um, even though circulation went up and, and, and newsstand went up mm. and people got used to it, that was the kind of reaction. Sometimes you would get um, criticism that was more specific, but mostly it was, what have you done to my magazine? Mm. And uh, I started collecting those. And by the way, we also got some that were p positive. If you ever have a chance to peek at Walter's collection of caddy hate mail, it's incredible. The glory days of tr reader trolling, there are telegrams, there are letters and diagrams. Um, they're incredible. How about you, Milton? How do you handle criticism? I can handle criticism from anyone except my wife. <laughs> Should we leave it at that? There is a larger question here in terms of how anyone responds to criticism or mm -hmm. to resistance, in fact. And one of the things that's very difficult from a career point of view and to, for somebody who has aspiration to succeed in life, you have to decide whether you're going to become a specialist or not. And you become a specialist, you pick a category that you become noted for, and then you become noted for it, and people ask you to do more of it. And before you know it, you're doing it all the time, whether you like to or not. That imprisonment that occurs professionally is something I've tried to avoid all my life. So I love the idea of embracing the negative, of embracing doubt, of moving towards what you don't know, about accepting failure as being a great tool for understanding Mm. what you're doing, mm. and for acknowledging the fact that if you can abandon what you already know, you have something glorious to look forward to. Mm. Uh, so I love criticism. Uh, and in the world of the arts, it's inevitable because all transgression is going to be rejected by the audience that is used to something. And that's why it's so difficult to initiate the new in any art form, in any political form, in anything, mm. because the resistance will come from people who are familiar with something and are comforted by that familiarity. Mm. So when you get some resistance, you know you're doing the right thing. Mm. <laughs> we have time. For, I have time for two more questions. And one of them is from a student from the MA program here, Dina Denaro. Um, the question is to you, Milton. Um, you have a documentary titled To Inform and Delight. Um, can you speak if this philosophy applies to magazine making as well? Yeah, I, I think uh, that is such a good definition of purpose for people involved in the arts and design. Uh, to inform and delight. What other experience would you like to have out of a work of art or music or magazines or tap dancing? I mean, the idea that you can both learn and be exhilarated by something mm -hmm. is so wonderful. What else could you hope for? Mm -hmm. It's, a, uh, I must say, a, a quote by Horace who said it for the first time, to inform and delight. When I came across those words, I said, yes, exactly. Wonderful. Um, again, before we end, a reminder, uh, we have a simple reception outside. Books will be there. Walter and Milton will be on hand to sign Magmen. My last question, I guess. Um, what is the one piece of advice you would give to anyone wanting to start a magazine today? <laughs> you know, 
Um, we were looking today at, um, at um, mag culture uh, in England showing uh, a huge amount of new magazines and, and, and older magazines, but independent magazines. They were very inventive, but they are magazines of a new era, the era of working on a magazine like Time in which you know that six million copies are being printed every week with your name on it mm. is just gone. These magazines, some of them beautiful, well-written, all about, um, there's a couple um, uh, about the uh, political system today or the uh, uh, arts today are small circulation to a very um, select audience because of, of distribution. They're all good. They, they all, I don't know how they're financed. God bless them that they exist. Uh, so but it is a different era. So what's the one piece of advice? I would say do it anyway. You know, um, um, there are, there, now most of them are both in print and digital. Mm. You can buy either. Uh, N plus one is uh, one that we were looking at recently. And, um, um, you know, I think if it's your passion, you, do, you go and do it. It's not as easy. There's, you can't take your portfolio or your writing samples around and, and get, um, you know, big bucks mm. for, um, uh, at a big magazine. But you can have fun mm. and you can do it. So Walter says, just do it. What about you, Milton? Don't even think about it. <laughs> Maybe that's a good note to end. <laughs> Thank you so much for being such an attentive audience. Again, Milton Glaser and Walter Bernard. <laughs>